Okay, welcome if you're joining us online. We also have a room full of people here at the library. My name is Holly and welcome to our talk on Bulgaria. We have Maria Fogarasi with us tonight, back by popular demand. I think this is her fourth, fourth program she's done for us. I think there's one more we haven't had yet. We will, we'll make that happen. <laughs> Um, if you're in the room here, there are some cool Bulgarian artifacts on a table on display. Thank you so much for setting that up. That is awesome. Um, I'm just going to pass it right over to you. Have at it. Um, I do want to mention tomorrow night's program is Travel 101. Um, if you are just getting back into travel after being home for a couple of years, um, Laura will talk about um, how to get started in travel. Next week, we have a talk on Orville and Catherine Wright. Um, and tonight's program, I always want to point out a big thank you to the Friends of the Library for sponsoring. All right, all yours. All right, well, thank you for tuning in and coming also to the library. It's my pleasure also to welcome the Bulgarians in the room who can fact check everything that I say. My name is Maria Fogarasi, and my husband, uh, is a retired foreign service officer. And in March of 1992, he was assigned to uh, to go to um, Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, you always hear about the State Department in American embassies, but we have many different divisions. And he worked for the Department of Commerce, so always promoting and supporting US business overseas. And Bulgaria, uh, our US embassy there, had not had a commercial department yet because the trade prior to 1990 had been almost exclusively with the Soviet Union. So he was asked to go and open an office. And so, <clears throat> so off we went. And we had two months of language training in Washington in January and February. And then we landed in, uh, in Sofia. Actually, we drove to Sofia. We didn't land there. So I take that back. So this is my presentation. I chose a rose on the screen, which is very significant for Bulgaria. You'll find out about that. And this is indeed uh, a Bulgarian rose. I had a little help picking one out uh, off the internet so I would show you the correct flower. So here we go. So actually the last time I gave this talk, it was on the 3rd of March. So I had chosen these uh, symbols because this is the Bulgarian National Day and it celebrates the establishment of the Bul Bulgarian state in 1878 when they defeated uh, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks after 500 years of dominance. So this remained in my slideshow and a salute to um, the 3rd of March there. You'll hear more about that later on. So the first thing I'd like you to know is that Bulgaria uses the Cyrillic alphabet. This would be if you were approaching Sofia, the capital, and you would see the sign in, in our alphabet and also in the Cyrillic alphabet, which was developed by two brothers, uh, Cyril and Methodius, who were born into a wealthy family in Thessalonica in the ninth century, but they chose to give away their worldly wealth. So actually I show two pictures here, but the one where they're dressed more humbly is probably how we should uh, remember them. They are venerated not only in Bulgaria, but in other countries. They took the Greek alphabet and developed the Cyrillic alphabet in order to translate the Bible and spread Christianity. They are sometimes called the apostles of the Slavs. They're the patron saints of Bulgaria. Their feast day is May the 24th, which is sometimes I've heard known as Cyril and Methodius Day or Slavonic Script Day or Education and Culture Day, various different um, interpretations. But um, so, and you find icons of them everywhere, all over the country in every um, Orthodox church. This would be the alphabet that they developed. You can see some similarities to ours, but it is also um, different. This alphabet is used in a couple of other countries around the world. It's used in uh, Russia, Ukraine, Mongolia of all places. I haven't quite gotten to the root of that. And Bulgaria, and there may be one or two others. So a salute to the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, this is what we're looking at today. We're looking at Bulgaria down in Southeast Europe. And just because Ukraine is always in the news, you'll notice that um, Bulgaria does not share a border with Ukraine. Ukraine would be further north now. It has Romania to the north, the Danube River for almost two thirds of the way being the border between the two countries. Um, <clears throat> the famous Black Sea coast on the right, and then both uh, Turkey and Greece and going over to Macedonia and Serbia or the former Yugoslavia 
And you can see Sofia, the capital, which is very, very far to the west in the country there. This is what we call the Balkans. If we talk about the Balkan countries, this section of land, uh, the former Yugoslavia, and then down, not necessarily Turkey, but the um, part of Turkey that's still Europe. So when we talk about the Balkans, we're talking about these countries. And one of them is, uh, is Bulgaria there. So my title, Balkan Wanderings, uh, that's, where that, uh, that's where that comes from. And this is just to go back to Cyril and Methodius just a moment and show how far they were able to go in their teachings and preachings, because you have to think the ninth century, they did not have anywhere near the transportation that we did. So they accomplished quite a bit and they really got around. And you can see how far north, even to the countries that don't use the Cyrillic alphabet, um, they were able to travel through and spread the word of the, of the Bible. And this is a statue of them in front of the um, National Library in Sofia. They are also the patrons of the, of the National Library in Bulgaria there. So I want you to see how mountainous this area is. You can see Bulgaria over on the, on the um, yes, over on the right. And just very, very mountainous. Bulgaria itself is uh, covered one third by mountains, mostly in the west and in the south, four significant mountain ranges that we'll talk about there. And I heard a uh, saying that said, um, you can tell me if you've ever heard of it, that the fields give rise to the pumpkins, whereas the mountains give rise to the people. And so Bulgaria, these are the four mountain ranges I'd like to mention. And I'll go through each one of them. There are the Balkans, the Rila Mountains, the Pirin Mountains, and the Rhodopes. And we'll start with the Balkan Mountains which are not the highest in there in the country, but they have the fiercest weather. And apparently almost as if it were a spine, you can hike from um, at the top, looking down with sweeping panoramas on both sides from the Western part of the country, almost over to the Black Sea, looking down on the um, verdant pastures there. And then we have the Rila Mountains, this would be the Rila National Park. They are the highest mountains in the country. They have these seven lakes, which are very famous for hiking, um, known as yeah, the Rila Lakes. They're glacial lakes connected by rivers, and they have different uh, names depending upon their shape. There's a kidney lake and an eye lake and a twin lake. Very, very popular hiking destination. You can also take a cable car up to these lakes and, and um, hike, hike around them. The Rila Mountains are also home to, well, here I found something about a mountaineering school that you could, uh, that you could attend that I wanted to, I wanted to intend the, um, excuse me, include the slide. And then we'll talk more about the Rila Monastery, which is pretty much the number one tourist attraction in the country, archeologically, culturally, historically, also in the Rila Mountains. And then now we're going further south. So we're getting to a warmer climate. We're getting to the Pyrian Mountains. Oh, also I just gave an example here in the Rila Mountains that I know I heard you um, saying, or one of our guests saying at the beginning that you can literally sign up for one of these um, eight day packages where everything will be done for you. And, you know, literally arriving in Bulgaria and it goes down until you see number eight tour of Sofia. So um, it's, it's all inclusive. Um, it's very, very economical for our, um, for our price standards. And it's a lot of beauty along the way. So this would be an example of an itinerary you might choose to follow. And you might stay in a guest house pictured here, or you might be further up more where there's uh, more snow and ice towards the top. Or you might be at the base of one of the ski resorts. That's a pretty big hotel down there. I know at least two very famous ski resorts. Skiing is uh, very popular in the country. And um, this is this is the um, oh you know my top. I think I'm showing the highest peak there, and I can't remember the name. So just forgive me on that. But um, so these would be the Pyrenean Mountains. You're moving moving further south. They're more um, more uh, a form of a slate gray and sharper peaks. And there are the glacial lakes and the deep conifer forests. And there was a big victory scored, scored for, um, for environmentalists in Bulgaria just in 2020, when the high court ruled against 
um, a move that would have allowed the um, deforestation and engineering construction in almost 60% of the national park and, uh, and logging in 48%. Um, um, so this was struck down by the high court and this is uh, a true victory for, for environmentalists in the Pirin National Park, which is home to, I had mentioned, well, the other one will be Borovets. You'll hear about that. This is Bansko, a very popular ski resort there. And here you can see it in the wintertime. And then uh, Pirin National Park is home to many different species of uh, flora and fauna. And then last of all, we come to the Rodopi Mountains. They are furthest south. They have always been very hospitable to human uh, hu people living there. I mean, ancient times, the Thracians and then the Romans coming through on their way to for their conquests, building their magnificent roads would be coming through here. Uh, traditionally, the shepherds here would find plenty of food for their flocks. And then when the weather gets cold, moving down closer to the water. So the Rodopis have a lot of, um, obviously they are greener. They look, they look different from the other mountain ranges. This is a um, advertising a horseback ride in the mountains. And um, uh, also, yeah, I don't show it here, but I will later. There's mountain biking, there is um, horseback riding, and also many, many different guest houses where you are very welcome to stay and you get absolutely fabulous meals. So we're going to start out in Sofia and we're going to move east. Um, we're going to hit, take a couple of day trips from Sofia then moving east to the town of Plovdiv. If you can see that just uh, is sort of in the middle underneath the word Bulgaria, and we will end up over on the Black Sea coast in my talk. But first we're going back into a little bit of history because all my talks have a little bit of history and geography in them. And sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. So I'm going to go to the flag of Bulgaria. Um, both Daniela and I, I think have our crossed um, American and Bulgarian friendship flags on. So the current flag of Bulgaria at the top, the white standing for peace or freedom or liberty, the green for the agriculture of the country. It's a very, very agriculturally rich country. It was um, a lot of the factories that were put in there during the Cold War years were uh, artificial and did not do well after the fall of the wall just because they just couldn't compete so uh, just very rich in every kind of agriculture and then red at the bottom for the courage uh, shown for the country over time. And then at the bottom, the flag from 1945 until 1990, uh, Bulgaria was known as the People's Republic of Bulgaria. It did have a communist government. This was the same flag pretty much, but with the symbol of the top, the lion surrounded by wheat sheaves with a red star at the top. There are two dates at the bottom. Initially, there was only the date of September 9th, 1944, when the uh, communists were able to take over the government. And then at some point in time in the 70s, I read uh, 681, which was the um, beginning of the first Bulgarian empire was added at the bottom of that symbol, but that flag is gone. So the one at the top would be the current flag for the country of Bulgaria. and. This is going back a little bit. Uh, you probably recognize a couple of people here. Winston Churchill was the prime minister of Great Britain. He was actually voted out of office towards the end of World War II and became prime minister again in 1951. But in 1946, he was invited by our American president, Harry Truman, to come to the United States and specifically in a town of Fulton, Missouri. He gave this very famous speech where he said from Stettin, which is in Poland, Tatine in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the face of the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. And we all know the term Iron Curtain, which once the Berlin Wall opened up on November 9th, 1989, caused the domino effect. So unfortunately, Bulgaria was one of the countries behind the Iron Curtain. It experienced an especially harsh form of communism when the communists were able, so during the during World War II, most of these countries were allied, of course, with Germany, but as uh, Bulgaria saw the tide turning in 1944, the uh, communists were able to gain power. And when they took over the government, there were only about 11,000 in Bulgaria itself. And the, um, the purge that followed was particularly um, 
devastating and, and, and bloody. And many people left the country, many people were imprisoned. And after that, Bulgaria was a satellite state, like most of these countries here of the Soviet Union, completely beholden to the Soviet Union for economic and any kind military assistance. It, if you compare it with Hungary, Hungary was much more liberal. Uh, its citizens, I'm not going to say they all traveled abroad, but there were tour groups that went abroad. There was very limited private enterprise. Hungary has always been popular with tourism, especially the city of Budapest. If a West German could not get a visum to visit his or her relative in East Germany, they would meet at Balaton Lake in Western Hungary. But Bulgaria was a much more harsher form of, of communism. And um, I don't think any of that would have been possible there. So, um, oh, and one other thing, actually, as far as these countries being allied with Germany during World War II, Bulgaria was very proud of the fact that it never delivered its Jewish population to the Germans. There were people in the government, uh, the czar at that time was a man named Boris III, and they stood their ground. Unfortunately, Boris III traveled to a meeting with Adolf Hitler in 1943 and, quote, developed a mysterious illness when he came back and passed away shortly thereafter, which was tragic. But uh, Bulgaria always stood its ground on that point and never delivered the Jewish population. And so um, this is the strong man of Bulgaria at the top. In the bottom, you see him with Mikhail Gorbachev, which is kind of ironic because Gorbachev, I think we can credit with never doing anything. When the Berlin Wall opened, he could have lifted a finger and sent in the troops like he did in uh, Budapest in 1956 or Prague in 1968. But I think at that point, he just saw that the writing was on the wall and let it go. But the Bulgarian uh, man you see here, Todor Zhivkov, was in power from 1954 until 1989. He was the longest serving of any of the communist dictators anywhere in Eastern Europe and um, his history. So, And then the next slide is just really going back in history. This is what we only see now in North Korea. We would have seen this in the Soviet Union. We would have seen a day glorifying the communist state. We would have seen at the top uh, right there, the um, proletari uh, up in Cyrillic at the top with Marx and Engels. And this is all in the past. Downtown Sofia looks completely different now. But um, again, you know, you, we do see this on TV with North Korea and we can kind of relate to, uh, to the kind of parades that, uh, that went on. So because Zhivkov used unusually harsh tactics during his regime, if you prescribed to the communist ideology, you had good jobs, you had good career chances, you had good education chances, good health opportunities. And if you didn't, you were marginalized at the edge of society. He had statues erected, and not only in Bulgaria, but throughout these countries to praise the Russians who had come in as liberators or also to praise Bulgarian heroes in the 19th century who were revolutionaries who fought against the Ottomans and tried to get Bulgaria some freedom. So this first one is a, is a monument to the, to the Soviet army in, in uh, Sofia. Um, this one is very interesting. It's called the Mount of Brotherhood. You never would have seen graffiti on any of these statues during the Cold War years, but today the entire world is covered with graffiti. And uh, this is a particularly interesting one because it salutes the partisans who were um, the fledgling Bulgarian state during World War II, who eventually achieved their aims when the communist government took rule. But this is one thing that happened sometime, I think it's sometime in the last 10 years, uh, Moscow was not happy, but Bulgaria is not is now a, a, a liberated state and free. But so here they've they've pictured Superman and Ronald McDonald and Santa Claus. And obviously this has since been um, taken uh, taken off the paint. And uh, but it was someone just expressing their disdain of the statue. And then in 2014, now we know these colors all too well in 2014 when Russia marched uh, uh, into Crimea. Um, they've painted the one soldier in the colors of the of the Ukrainian Ukrainian flag there. So just a way of expressing uh, political um, dislike for what used to be. And then uh, this would be for Vasilevsky during the day. Vasilevsky was a revolutionary during the 19th century. I believe he was executed. This would be the statue at night, some kind of a sound and light show going on in the background there, right in the middle of Sofia. 
and um, last another one to the Soviet army, to the liberators. And again, you see this in other countries because they may have helped liberate Bulgaria from the Ottoman Turks, but what they brought was a completely new system and definitely not one where people felt liberated. So again, the dislike of the statue with the red pain. And typical uh, Eastern uh, architecture, very strong, very determined, uh, the worker, the worker state. And this one is just something that is truly bizarre because this is out in the countryside. This is not in Sofia, but this is a monument by the name of Vuzluzda, and it looks like a UFO. And it was built in 1981 and it took a long time to build. The cost would be equivalent today to about $35 million. And it was the, the party headquarters where Todor Zhivkov would hold his meetings. And they spared absolutely no expense. You can see already some verses on the outside and then the inside um, with, uh, with uh, murals and with uh, red stars and the glass ceiling. And it looked a lot more elaborate. I do have to thank the internet for some of my photos. I could not have uh, taken these myself. So it was just a, an incredible white elephant which lasted up until about 1989, 90 when communist was no more in the country. I did read that Zhivkov had some kind of a ta time capsule put in one of the walls. I don't know if that's true, but this next picture here, um, these um, it's covered up at the top there, but there is a tour that you can take of communist landmarks, which is pretty popular for foreigners because these are all empty. I don't think you can, I'm not sure you can climb uh, on this monument as is depicted there with the one individual, but they are silent testimonies and tributes to the past. And so this UFO like uh, statue is uh, included on one of those tours that I read about there. So, okay, so Bulgaria does not use the Euro. It uses the Lev here, obviously with the Cyrillic alphabet. And if you see down next to the 20, 20 and then Leva in the Cyrillic, the four letters. So sometimes in the US you'll be doing a crossword puzzle and it will say, what is a currency with four letters? And the answer is usual, usually L-E-V-A. So I gave that away. Uh, Bulgaria is a member of NATO, um, uh, but it's not the, um, it's end of the EU, I should say, but not of the Schengen Treaty, meaning again, that it doesn't use, use the Euro. And we're going now to the very heart of Sofia. We're going to the number one landmark in Sofia, which is the absolutely gorgeous um, Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, which was built to honor approximately 200,000 Bulgarian, Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian uh, soldiers who fought 1878, 1888 in the war against the Ottoman Turks to get them out of the country after 500 years. Um, they did succeed. And Bulgaria became an autonomous state within the Ottoman Empire and then gained its complete freedom in 1908. But it was already autonomous after this war was fought. And so this cathedral was actually started at that time, but most of it was built after 1902. Um, the cathedral is Eastern Orthodox. Bulgaria is um, a country that practices Eastern Orthodox religion. I read that approximately 60% of the people would call themselves Eastern Orthodox. I don't know whether they are all church going. It's a very, um, it's a country with open religious tolerance. And so pretty much any religion can be practiced there. There are tiny percentages of, um, of Muslim, very tiny percentage of Jewish and uh, perhaps something else, but it's basically um, Orthodox. Alexander Nevsky, the name of the cathedral, he was a Russian prince way back when, famous for his military victories. And so he has been canonized by the, by the Russian church. So just for one second here, why is it Eastern Orthodox? Um, let's go back to 800 and something AD where Pope Leo III, up if you see uh, Aachen, if you see Holy Roman Empire, and then you see in Germany, Cologne and Aachen. Aachen is by the Belgian border. And that is where um, Karl the Great or Charlemagne was living. And Leo III crowned him uh, the Holy Roman Emperor. 
Well, the Eastern Orthodox Church over in Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, they weren't really pleased with that because they felt that they had upheld the church, especially since the fall of Rome in 460 AD. So they didn't agree with that move. And the two sides started to move away from each other. And then, you know, the Pope in Rome didn't speak Greek. The, the leader in Constantinople didn't speak, uh, obviously, um, Italian. And uh, so it came down to what's known as the Great Schism of 1054. And that's how we have these two branches of Christianity. Um, also, one side used leavened bread in the, in the ritual, in the ceremony, and the other side unleavened. And there were some other differences. But that's it in a nutshell, why you have this um, Eastern Orthodox uh, branch of the of the um of Christianity there and then this is just uh showing showing the split this is the Pope Peter the first Pope uh on my left here and then uh, I don't know the uh, name of who would be heading the um, Orthodox Church but he would be he would be on the right so Alexander Nevsky is absolutely gorgeous um it can hold up to 500 individuals they uh, would stand during services uh unless you're um elderly or pregnant or not feeling well, but the congregation stands, I was told, to be ready to serve God, uh, to feel closer to God. So that is very common here. And then you see, obviously, many of the icons with the saints, and you see that absolutely gorgeous chandelier, and you're very welcome. Whoops, you're very welcome to go inside. It's, um, it is open to the public and to walk around. And then this would be looking over at Alexander Nevsky. Um, at nighttime. So it's just absolutely beautiful. And it's pretty much the like the navel, the center of the capital of, of Sofia. So over here, you saw in the background, we're heading toward the mountains. And so this is Mount Vitusha. This is Sofia is literally at the foot of Mount Vitusha. It's a mountain massif. It's approximately 17 by 19 uh, kilometers, so almost square. And it's your getaway for fresh air and for hiking and for skiing and snowboarding and anything else you care to do. It's readily accessible uh, by bus and other public transportation. Uh, it has four peaks and it, it, they, these four peaks come together at one peak um, known as um, Chernivra, which is the black peak, which I don't think we can see there, but there is peak up there. And uh, there's a weather station up there appropriately enough. So um, anyway, it's just great to get out of the city and go and uh, um, up there and uh, everybody everybody does that. And then when you come down, well, now we didn't have any of these when we lived there. We were there from 92 to 94, uh, but you can great, get these great books and uh, find out about the hiking trails and just about everything else about Vitusha. And then when you come down, there's a boulevard now. It's very attractive. It's very typically European. Um, you know, with the outdoor cafes and the flowers and uh, very, very lively. There's at night over on the right, there's a street artist and he's put out his hat to collect some coins. So very, very busy uh, thoroughfare here and pedestrian also. This would be the poet Slavikov with his son. He was a publicist. He further developed the language. So this statue of the two of them sitting um, somewhere on Bitosha Boulevard is a, is a tribute to the two men. And now we're coming to this absolutely beautiful hotel. So when we were there, it was the Sheraton Sofia. So I have to admit, it's not the Sheraton anymore. So this is slightly incorrect. It's just the Hotel Balkan, but it was built in 1956. And it's very typical, um, sort of a, a classical socialism type of architecture. And they blended it with uh, ultimate luxury. Most Bulgarians never <clears throat> never would have gone inside this hotel during the Cold War years. And, um, but obviously that changed in 1990. Uh, the foreigners and the diplomatic community held many, many events inside there. And um, this would be the hallway and um, just, uh, just very, very beautiful interior, open of course now to anybody who wants to be there. This would be the uh, hotel from the outside, still with the Sheraton S at the top. And then, okay, there were already some Roman ruins there, but this happened after we left. So I need to go back and see this because in 2015, so Sofia in the Roman Empire was Sertica, ancient Sertica was the name of the city. And it was suspected there might be a forum underneath the ground in this plaza in front around the hotel. So they started digging 
And they were absolutely amazed because they didn't find the forum, but they found this massive, massive building, which is suspected. Well, first of all, the walls of it are two to three meters thick. So it is suspected that it was two to three um, uh, levels, floors. Um, it was destroyed in the fifth or sixth century, probably by an earthquake. We're not quite sure when it was built. So the strong suspicion is that it was either um, ancient baths for the Romans or the legendary palace of Constantine the Great, who ruled from 306 to 337 AD and was rumored to um, be very fond of visiting uh, Sertica. And so this is absolutely fascinating. They've also found evidence of underfloor heating for which the Romans were very famous. And then, you know, usual, maybe some pottery or some coins. And this is all right in the middle of the capital city. And it's just a real archeological treasure. I mean, that's an understatement to call it that. Um, and so here you see um, some ongoing work. And um, this is also, this one's from the, from the internet. This is right also there, but this is a hotel. The name is Arena de Sertica. And this hotel has built into it, they found an amphitheater, one of the largest in the Roman Empire, they suspect, where you would have had this fierce fighting of gladiators and wild beasts. And they've incorporated it into the hotel very nicely so that even if you're not staying there, apparently these glass windows, you can look down. So Sophie is finding a great way to, um, to highlight these uh, ruins. And again, I'm sure that site I showed you at the beginning doesn't look like that anymore because this is seven years later. So it's time to go back and take a look. And uh, by the way, this is a great time to travel to Europe because your dollar is incredibly strong if you follow currency exchange rates. And uh, so this would be that particular uh, that particular site there. And then this area around the, um, the Hotel Balkan, again, noting the, is known as the Square of Religious Tolerance. This would be the, um, another Byzantine church, St. Nadalia from the 10th century. Uh, and there it is uh, from the side view there. Um, this is probably the oldest building in Sofia. This is St. George from the fourth century. And St. George has had a very lively history, probably used at the beginning for ceremonies, maybe when uh, the emperor came to town. Uh, then when Christianity was mandatory across the Roman Empire, it would have been used for baptisms. When the Ottoman Turks came in, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Okay, so when the Ottomans came in, then the inside walls would have been whitewashed, as was the practice for, uh, for mosques, and it became a mosque. I read that later on it was a mausoleum, and now it's back to being a very small Orthodox church, and there are also concerts uh, given there. So this is a tribute to um, St. George there, this fourth century. And again, you've got um, just, a, just for archaeologists, just a dream uh, right in front of, and it has the Hotel Balkan on all three sides. You can, you can see the, uh, the walls there. This would be the, the uh, synagogue, one of, um, uh, one of maybe two in the country. It's a beautiful Moorish revival style. It could hold up to 1,300 people, but most of the Jewish population in Bulgaria emigrated either to the then Palestine or the current Israel. So there might be 50 or 60 people at a worship ceremony. There is a small museum in it, and there is this uh, massive chandelier weighing 1.7 tons, which is rumored to have come from ancient Palestine. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty hefty chandelier there. And then also in the vicinity, you have a small mosque, Banya Bashi, meaning many baths. There are thermal sites, and this bath, this mosque is built uh, either on top or maybe right next to the um, one thermal site, and you can see the, the steam coming up through the, through the ground there. This is the archaeological museum. It goes without saying that you're going to see quite a bit in here. And I want to point to the back wall there and mention the Thracians who were in this region before the Romans. The Thracians were warrior tribes. They had kind of a kingdom, but they have no written, they had no written language, and they were on the fringes of the Greek and Roman societies and lasted actually for about five centuries before they were conquered by the Romans. They were known for waging war, making wine, and exquisite uh, metallurgy. Uh, for jewelry and for ornamentation. 
And so this museum contains quite a bit of what has been found. And this next one is absolutely stunning. This is a burial mask of um, probably a Thracian king that was found about 200 kilometers east of Sofia. And it weighs about 600, it's pure gold. It's about 600 grams. And it's one of the um, unequivocally um, fabulous finds for uh, in, in antiquity, anywhere, anywhere in the world, this, this burial mask. And outside the uh, museum, there is a handsome lion that everybody likes to sit on and pose with pictures. And then the, the, tomb, of the tomb of the unknown soldier here. So this was the palace. Um, I, mentioned, I mentioned Tsar Boris III, who had been the Tsar uh, leading into the Second World War. And this palace would have been built by his father, Ferdinand II. It would have been the city palace. And when Ferdinand II married in 1893, uh, Marie Louise of Bourbon Parma, he very much wanted his city to look like Vienna or Budapest, but Sofia had unpaved streets at the time. So his Habsburg relatives sent him bricks and yellow bricks from a, uh, from a pit somewhere near Budapest. They actually weren't laid until 1907, but hence Bulgaria Sofia, Sofia specifically, has what some people now call a yellow brick road. And so you can say I'm from Sofia, you know, I was born on the yellow brick road. And um, so he got his, he got his paved road. And this would have been Ferdinand here. Ferdinand's on the left, looking very handsome there. And then on the right, a picture appearing with Marie Louise, his wife. And so this would have been their palace within the city of Sofia. And these are the yellow bricks. They're a little bit slippery when they're wet, but, um, but they um, give the capital something very unique. I don't think there's any other capital that can claim anything like that. So I like to point that out. The palace is actually a modern art museum now where I love the way the paintings have been displayed here and very decorative. So you can go in there and browse um, the art or it's also uh, an ethnographic museum where you can see the different costumes that would be native to different parts of the of the country and the different cultural um, customs in this museum here. Um, this next one goes back again to the past, but I point it out because um, so when uh, the communists took power, there was a leader named Georgi, Georgi Dimitrov, and when he died, he died very suddenly, and the people were very um, like, what should we do? What should we do? And they decided to follow the pattern of Lenin, who is has is entombed in uh, Moscow. You can go see Lenin's tomb. And they built this mausoleum in six days and made it like a so much like a fortress that it was, I read, almost could have withstood a nuclear war. And into this went the embalmed body of Georgi Dimitrov. And um, I, it was, uh, for instance, when I gave that talk at Westland, one of the ladies said it was obligatory for all the school children to go in there. It was very dark, it was very spooky, and it's very costly to maintain this kind of setup here. So after the 90s, there was a lot of debate about what would happen or what should happen to this, to this building, and the government decided to take it down. But the, when they went to try to detonate it, it was so well built that it took four tries and so the joke was six days to build, six days to take down. So it doesn't exist anymore. At one point I had read there's a, um, uh, there are a maze of tunnels underground that there might be some kind of museum in there, but I can't find anything about it online. So I don't know if it's true or not, but it doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore, but the, it's just a great story for the past. And uh, this would be the, um, the National Assembly downtown. You can see clearly the, the yellow, the yellow bricks in this picture. And this would be the liberating Russian Tsar Nicholas, uh, the, um, the great liberator, um, the Tsar Osvo Boditel on his horse, he would have been leading the charge in 1878, 1879, 18, I'm good, 1878, yeah, anyway, against the Ottomans that we've mentioned a couple of times now. So here he has his back to us and he's facing the National Assembly and you can see that gorgeous um, Alexander Nevsky Cathedral in the background there. Um, this is a market place. This market, this whole building was not open when I lived there, but it's since been renovated and it's a covered market. So you can go inside and browse and find 
probably, you know, whatever you want to find, fresh fruits, vegetables, things like that. And this is a very pretty little Russian church. The Russians uh, took down a mosque when they came and um, erected this church, St. Nicholas, which is a very popular photo motif in the capital city. And this would be the National Theater, Ivan Vazov. So the inside, the lobby is, um, is beautiful with panoramas of Bulgarian scenes from Bulgarian plays, actors, actresses. Uh, you do have to buy a ticket to go inside. It's very opulent. Um, sometimes if you're in another country, even if you don't know the language, it's worth going to a performance just to soak up the atmosphere and the building itself. So this would be the National Theater, and this would be looking at the National Theater with the water nymph, the statue of the water nymph uh, in front of it right there. And then a completely different season. I just love this picture because this is a kiosk in the snow in that same area there where you know you could buy a little cup of very strong coffee or newspaper and you might not linger so much in the winter time, but it's just it's just such a pretty picture. So, but after the winter starts to leave and you come to the first of March, you come to a um, Bulgarian custom that is not known in any other country of the world. And this little combination of red and white tassels is known as the Martinitsa. And so on the 1st of March, you would say to someone, Chestita Baba Marta Day, Happy Baba Marta, Baba Marta meaning Grandmother Marta, who represents the month of March. And if she is in a bad mood and grumpy, you have bad weather. So you hope that she's in a good mood and smiling. So you have good weather. And actually, Daniela has a book about Baba Marta over there and the Bulgarian um, school in our greater Detroit area, the school children, they honor this day. And everybody makes um, Martinitsas. And then you're supposed to go give a Martinitsa to someone and they tie it around their wrist. And I think when you see the first tree, fruit tree blooming, you can tie here, you see the buds of the fruit tree, or maybe out in the country, if you see the first stork, you can tie it onto a tree. Here would be um, exactly that, probably a school class. And they can be made out of cotton or wool or silk, and they can take different shapes or forms. At the top, you see the little dolls. Is it, maybe you can see it um, here, the teacher is, and everybody's wearing red and white the white for the driven snow and the red for the sun, which hopefully is going to get stronger and bring more warmth every day as the month of March progresses. And those little dolls at the top, ah, here, here, this is so pretty because they've been tied to the tree and they've all tangled up in the wind there, the Martinitsas. But um, these little dolls I wanted to show you, Pizzo and Penda, little boy and girl, these are so pretty. Someone's Someone's made them and then crocheted. So they are also a popular motif on March the 1st. So again, everybody gives everybody a Martinitsa and, um, and Bulgaria is the only country that has this custom. And here the family cat, somebody made a Martinitsa for the family cat. I think that's such a beautiful cat in that picture. So we want to honor the, the 1st of March. Um, okay, back to Alexander Nevsky, some of the popular souvenirs, and um, we'll get to the ones that Daniela has over there. Icons, obviously, with Bulgarian saints. These are from Russia, the nesting dolls, but they're very popular. And then, uh, obviously, more with foreigners, but the old communist uh, medals that have been gathered together are always uh, on for sale where you see the tourists. Um, this is the Museum of Natural History, and you're probably thinking, why is she even showing us this? <laughs> but when I was there, um, I had two very young children, and in the wintertime, so this has been 92, 93, and so if we didn't have a play date at someone's house, we really didn't know where to go, so we spent hundreds of hours in this museum, and then, <laughs> and often we were the only people in there, so I have very fond memories of this museum, and then when I was researching for this talk, I learned that Ferdinand II, was an avid naturalist. He was a botanist, he was an um, ornithologist, he was a lepidopterist, butterflies, and all these species were his collection. And this is the oldest museum in the city of Sofia. So I thought, oh, if we had known that back then. But um, so I wanted to pay tribute to the Natural History Museum in Sofia. And then this is, this is, this is again an example of that um, 
that style of architecture with the with the um, socialist classicism on the on the right is actually the Hotel Balkan, except this side of the right is a government ministry. And looking straight at us, the complex of the three is known as the Largo. So looking straight at us is now the National Assembly. It was the political her, her, political party headquarters from 45 to 90. There would have been a red star, but right now we have the beautiful Bulgarian flag on all three of the buildings. And over on the left, you have the number one department store in Sofia, which is known by its acronym TSUM, just meaning central department store. And so this is very, very, for architects who study this kind of um, classical socialist architecture, this is probably one of the best examples in Southeastern Europe, this complex here. And um, this, well, it's blocked off, but up at the top, there is a red star. So this would have been in the old days. And here it is. And this is really interesting because again, with more Roman ruins having been excavated, this, this sort of plexiglass uh, uh, oval that you see there is, um, I think this is back when I took this slide, the mayor of Sophie explaining it, but this is also another whole segment of um, archaeological finds that they have um, displayed. And um, I think it's kind of neat with that, with that oval uh, roof up on the top there. And this would be, again, the central department store, which was an absolute must if you visited Sofia. I mean, you had to go to Tsum. And now, you know, there are, it's just like any big department store that you would find anywhere in the world. So that would be the Largo. Again, one more great photo shot of the Largo in modern times now with what they've done down the middle, looking very pretty. And again, this would have been before that existed. Again, you can see those, um, those yellow bricks on the road there. So where did the Red Star go when it was because the angry mob stormed that parliament in 1990 and um, that Red Star came down pretty fast, but Bulgaria decided that they should keep these monuments all these monuments from all over the country, but nobody really wanted to look at them, but they created a museum of socialist art. There was some debate, museum of to totalitarian art, socialist art, but they decided on socialist. So this is very, very interesting. It's quite large, it's indoor and outdoor. Uh, Budapest has something similar. They have Statue Park. So they did not destroy these because actually they are part of the history. Over here on the right, you can see um, uh, Mr. Lenin there holding his, uh, holding his uh, coat lapel. And uh, um, I didn't ever find the name, but I like the statue. So it must have something to do with art at that time. And then there's also an indoor area with videotapes and posters. And again, going back and preserving um, history. These two busts at, on the far end are uh, Marx and Engels. And then you have Lenin. And then you have um, all over the Eastern Bloc, the hated and despised dictator, uh, Joseph Stalin here on my, on my right there. Uh, so this is NDK. This is known as the Palace of Culture. It's not really a palace at all. It's the largest of its kind in Southeastern Europe. It's for conferences, it's for trade shows, it's for symposiums, it's for many, many different uses. It's a mass of glass and steel. 10,000 pounds of steel, that's 3,000 pounds more than the Eiffel Tower. And it was built in 1981 to commemorate the 1300th anniversary of the founding of the Bulgarian state. It was the brainchild of the daughter of Toda Zhivkov, Ludmila Zhivkova, Zhivkova. She had an unusually high position for a woman at that time in the communist government, country, those countries, it was not usual to have a woman with uh, influence in the government, but she was in charge of all of the um, education and the cultural affairs for the country. She died at the age of 39 of a, of a brain tumor, but this was her brainchild. And this is what it looks like now. Uh, my husband was very fortunate. His office was not within the US embassy. It was in NDK, meaning a lot less bureaucracy trying to reach him. Our American embassies are rather fortress-like. They need to be. Um, with for many different reasons and that we're not the only country with a lot of security. But uh, um, so he had his office at the at the NDK here. And, um, and then one more before we leave Sophia, a monument to the bells, also a um, um, 
we can attribute this to Lumia Zhivkova. This was in 1979 when the United Nations declared the year to be the year of the child. So this was created with the tower with four, uh, four sides for the four directions and then seven bells at the top for the seven continents of the world. And then at the bottom, there are 93 different bells, either from countries or from organizations that honor or help children, each one with their name on it or perhaps a donor. So this is the Monument of the Bells. So we are leaving Sofia now. We are on the road and we are heading to the Rila Monastery, which is in, as I had said, the Rila Mountains. And it's also a day trip, by the way. It's not that far from Sofia and it's a very popular day trip. And here you have the gorgeous Rila Monastery, which is um, the number one uh, as far as archaeology, not as far as history, cultural, and even um, architecture site in, in the country. The Rila Monastery was built in the, um, it was started in the 10th century, but it did not look like this. It was much smaller, and at some point there was a fire, and then when it was rebuilt, many wealth, wealthy Bulgarians donated uh, money to um, fund this absolutely gorgeous building here. Um, it is at the monastery. So, and then of course you have the uh, the murals here. You can see on the walls there. I like the undulating um, curves of the building. And this is looking down on it in the setting in the Rila Mountains. Uh, Bulgaria has, I read they might have up to 600 monasteries, but many of them are much smaller. When we came in 1992, we had a brochure that highlighted the 12 most frequently visited. So these monasteries are extremely important in Bulgarian history. They were the depositories and where much of the literature and the paintings were developed. They were a safe haven during the 500 years of Ottoman rule. They were also a safe haven for revolutionaries who were, um, you know, who didn't want to be caught by the Ottomans. And some of them are, are up on, on almost unapproachable cliffs. Um, this, one is, this one is readily accessible. There are some monks who live here. I don't think it's a large contingent, but it is a working monastery. And again, a very popular day trip out of Sofia. And uh, just a couple of more, um, couple more pictures with the mountains in the background. And then the gorgeous, just gorgeous inside there. And a great deal of Bulgaria's wealth, obviously, in some of these monasteries. You can you can see that right there, and then the uh, the passage outside, and uh, the souvenir booth, and uh, so so the name comes from Ivan Rilski, who was a hermit who lived in a cave. So obviously, it would have been his students who built the first uh, Rila monastery, uh, right um, where probably where he was. And um, this is a really pretty picture also, uh, the snow scene there. Um, I don't think Ivan Rielski ever thought his name would be on a spa, but here it is, the spa hotel <laughs> honoring him. And he is also, here's the one leva note. You can see the monastery on the one side of the bill and you can see him on the other side. He is a saint of the Orthodox church. And uh, here he is um, even on the, the coin the one lev uh, coin. Um, very close to the Rila Monastery is, we saw Ban Bansko, the one ski resort, and down here at the bottom, you can read the word Borovets is the other probably famous um, ski resort in, um, in uh, Bulgaria, also very, very close to Sofia. And um, it's a uh, big business in the winter time. I read somewhere, um, Borovets in Bulgaria for a cheap and cheery vacation. <laughs> I like that slogan. And you can get a ski package there for you know a fraction of what we pay in the United States, and you can get some you can get some good skiing. So Borovets was also the site where um, uh, Ferdinand II built a palace, a getaway palace for himself, and this would be in the summertime with the hiking um, and the mountain biking. So his little palace, or I should say, more of a hunting lodge, a Tsarska Bistritsa. Is, um, is located there. And um, here you can see some of the, um, the game. I'm not sure whether this is open to the public right now. I have to be careful of what I say there, but this would have been, uh, so I said that was Ferdinand II who built this. This is his son, Boris III, 
with his wife and his two children, Simeon and Marie Louise. And this is where Marie Louise would have received this tragic news that her husband had taken ill after coming back from Berlin in 1943. The boy in the middle, Simeon, uh, so the family um, after the after the um, the war, uh, then Simeon became the czar, but he was so young, he ruled with a regent, and I believe they went into exile uh, in Spain after um, after the war. There was no more royalty in any of the countries behind the Iron Curtain. That just didn't mesh well with the communist ideology, to say the least. Um, I want to go back to Sofia for just a minute. Um, when I showed you the little palace downtown that's now an art museum, I said that that was the city palace. This is the palace where the royal family spent most of their time. The name of the palace is Vrana, not to be confused with Varna, a big city on the Black Sea. Vrana means crow in Bulgarian. And Ferdinand, the naturalist, when he was having this built, said he was going to name it after the first bird that he saw. So consequently, and we knew nothing about this when we were in Sofia, and it just lay in ruins for years, but lately it's been resurrected now. And again, Ferdinand, Bulgaria was a young country when he came to power. He had no greenhouses, he had no seedlings, so he had specimens shipped from all over the world. And this park is supposed to be fabulous with over 400 different specimens of plants and trees. And I think it's, I know it's open to the public. I think you have to take a guided tour, but so I did want to um, point this out. Um, Simeon, you saw the little boy who became regent in 1943, or czar, but he was too young to rule. He did return to Bulgaria and served as prime minister from I think 2001 to 2005. He was born in 1937. So I have three pieces of Simeon trivia for you. Uh, first of all, he's only he's one of two rulers who, who were rulers during World War II who are still alive today. So obviously the other person must have been someone who was also very young at the time, and it's the Dalai Lama. Secondly, he's the only person in the entire world who carried at one time the title czar. There are no more czars. And thirdly, He's one of two individuals who was once royalty and was subsequently elected in a democratic election. The other one being the now deceased Prince of Cambodia, Norodom Sihanouk. So Simeon has a lot of um, interesting facts behind him. He and his wife, so he would be about 85 now, and they live on the palace grounds of Vrana. There was a lot of talk after Bulgaria gained its freedom, and especially when Simeon came back to the country, would, would Bulgaria have a monarchy again? Do these properties belong to Simeon and his sister? Do they belong to the Bulgarian people? Um, I do believe that Vrana, he's given to, to the people, but he does have the right to live in this, in this house. And then Vrana itself, now the, the inside rooms have been, been restored um, for here. You could probably rent this for a, for a very uh, formal event. And here you would see um, on the left, that would be Boris, uh, the Tsar Boris in the frame, and then down on the right, uh, Ferdinand II. So um, I really want to go back and see this because, um, well, because I'm just very curious about it and I never got to see it. So, okay, so we went to the Rila Monastery. Another popular day outing is to a very small town, Koprivtica, which the highlight of the town would be seeing the um, traditional Bulgarian architecture. It's very small and very picturesque and uh, just very, very pretty to, uh, to walk around the town. Um, so another outing will take you to one of Bulgaria's most famous sites. And here we come back to that rose at the beginning of the show where previously when um, I had made this show and I didn't know Daniela so well, I showed her the beginning of my show and she said, that's not a Bulgarian rose that you have at the beginning of your show. So anyway, I now have a Bulgarian rose, thanks to Daniela. But we are going to the Valley of the Roses about 200 kilometers east of Sofia and Bulgaria's claim to fame because it produces 60% of the world's um, uh, rose oil for the perfume industry. So it's big business. And the headquarters is the town of Kazanluk, and they have a festival every year uh, in May or June. And it's, um, it's just very, very pretty. Um, miles and miles of these roses, which are best picked uh, before dawn, 
uh, when the dew is still out. And this is, I took this from a cookbook. This would be an old, um, this would be in the old days, the traditional perhaps dress. And she's, uh, she's picking the, uh, the rose petals there. And then this would again be uh, in modern times, the, the festival. And this would be bringing the uh, rose petals in to be put into the vat so that the oil could be extracted. It's incredibly expensive, about 40,000 euros for, uh, for a liter. So the euro is just about now one-to-one -one with your dollar. It's another reason to go to Europe. <laughs> and uh, um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot, it's a tremendous amount of income for, I also read that there's a new museum in Kozunluk, which is very comprehensive and you could spend a whole day learning about the industry. So this is known as the Valley of the Roses, by the way. Um, again, the festival with different ethnic costumes there and just a really upbeat atmosphere. And of course the rose is always, always at the center of attention there. There's also a um, arakia, a fire water, a schnapps made with the um, with the roses, which I suppose you could try just a little bit if you if you wanted to. So, okay, so we were over here uh, at the left on Sofia, and we are headed now to the middle of the country. If you can see a town called Plovdiv there, which is sort of in the middle, we're off to Plovdiv, and um, Plovdiv again. This is this picture is from the internet. Plovdiv, layer upon layer of history, probably going back 8,000 years. And the Daily Telegraph in Great Britain has called Plovdiv possibly the second oldest city in the world after Damascus. So it has a real claim to fame. In 2019, it was designated by the European Union as one of its cultural capitals. This is an extremely prestigious title. In that year, there were four Bulgarian cities and possibly others vying for that title. So Plovdiv won along with a smaller um, town in Italy, Matera. So this is very prestigious and there's a lot of EU funding for exhibits and highlighting the town. And so uh, it was a big, a big win for the city of Plovdiv. Here we're looking um, over, the, over the rooftops. There is a, a mosque off to the left there. Um, and then Plovdiv also has a, a Roman amphitheater and it has, um, it has uh, again, beautiful murals on the churches. And um, I did read that, uh, so during the Cold War years, we in the US probably wouldn't have known this, but Bulgaria was one of the world's largest exporters of tobacco mainly to um, within the East Bloc. And I believe Plovdiv was the center of that industry. It, I don't think that there's so much tobacco now, but maybe we can hear about that afterwards. But again, that traditional architecture where the house is very narrow at the bottom and then more space as you go up. And this is the Ethnographic Museum. Um, just one quick word that there are so many thermal springs in Bulgaria. And so this is another great draw for tourists or for the locals, some of them combined with Roman ruins. And uh, so you've got history and you've got relaxation uh, together, which is always very popular when you're touring. And then we're moving over. Rila is the number one monastery. Um, this would be Bochkovo, the second most popular monastery. This is a drawing depicting Bochkovo Monastery outside there. And then um, I think I also showed the uh, Troyan, which is the third, the third largest one. And I think they're all working monasteries and they're very popular for, uh, for visitors. Uh, another um, set of murals on the walls out there. Um, we're shooting up to the um, capital of the second Bulgarian kingdom. We're moving closer to the coast, uh, built on uh, hillsides here. Just a quick shot of um, Veliko Tarnovo. And um, uh, I don't remember the name of the fortress in it, but uh, what's that? Oh, thank you, Tsarovitz, thank you. And I love this picture of Gorka Street, just the way it's been painted. And it's been, you know, with the plants and the greenery, it's, I just think it's so pretty. So we are coming to the seacoast now, the last part of um, my talk with Varna, the third largest city in the country. It's the maritime capital and pretty much the regional capital in that area for all kinds, all different kinds of administration. And uh, you can see that it is right on the water there. It um, also has some buildings that have been uh, renovated and look just absolutely gorgeous here. 
Here's another one there with the colors. And uh, this is the mother of Dormition Church, which would be the second largest in the country after Alexander Nevsky. Um, these are the very famous Golden Sands, which start about 17 kilometers north of Varna, this stretch of the Black Sea coast that has attracted visitors for years. And first of all, within uh, during that time when uh, if during the Cold War, you could not travel outside the Soviet bloc, but you could travel to other countries. So it would be very popular to come to the Black Sea coast. And now visitors from all over Europe and the world come here. So they're known as the Golden Sands because it's very pretty, pretty beach area there by Varna. And then this is really fabulous. This is the Varna necropolis. So in 1972, a machinist was out approximately four kilometers from the center of the city, and he uh, discovered the first of 292 graves with, this is the largest uh, and the biggest gold find in the history of our world. And this particular one probably was a ruler. It looks like um, there's a scepter in the hand. And going back to 4000 BC, so probably the Thracians, again, well known for working with metal and working with jewelry. And I think this is the same um, individual just shown a little bit more of the body, but incredible, um, 292 graves. These, uh, this, um, this exhibit, not, not all of it, but some of it, uh, and again, uh, small pieces of, of metal that uh, would have been used for different, different purposes uh, twice in the United States. Um, 1998, roughly, and then 2009, 2010, um, we have had this exhibit um, I, at least once in New York City, and I'm not sure about the second time where they're showing about ancient gold. So again, this whole necropolis, um, it is pretty well agreed internationally that this is one of the most important finds worldwide in prehistory in the way that it's been preserved in Varna. This is just north of Varna. This is a very beautiful little town of Balchik there that was the favorite of Queen Marie of Romania because it went back and forth. The border changed a couple of times, but it has just very beautiful gardens that you can visit there. That would be Balchik. And then you would go down to Nesebor, which is almost like out on an island. It's a UNESCO heritage site. And um, just, you know, just very pretty everywhere um, to wander and to look and to learn. And uh, this is Nesebor also. And then the second largest city on the Black Sea coast, Burgas, again with the beach and um, with the very famous boulevard and um, illuminated at night in a very pretty way. So I go just for, oh, and then this, yeah, this was actually Daniela taught me about this. This is very popular at the sea coast. These are the Nestinari. They are historically with folklore, I believe, fire dancers, and they can dance on the embers. And they have been incorporated this into um, for tourists. They can do the dance. And I think there's probably music with it. So, so the fire dancers there, which uh, um, is, uh, is another draw actually for that area of the country. Um, and then just very briefly, the food, because you always have to talk about food and you have to talk about the delicious soups and stews. They're not, they're not spicy, but they're just very succulent. And uh, um, also grilling is very popular for uh, in Bulgaria. Um, the Shopska salad, I never knew it with olives, but I suppose with olives, it's the cucumber, the tomato, and the famous Bulgarian feta cheese. This one also has, has onion. Um, this is the banitsa. It's almost like a phyllo dough, again, with the, the cheese. You can drizzle honey on it if you want to, or eat it plain. This is a gavrek. I think this is uh, the Turkish influence. This is a yeast, kind of a large donut covered in sesame seeds. And then this is um, taurator, which is a cold cucumber soup. It has um, some walnuts sprinkled on the top. And this is also Bulgaria's claim to fame. Bulgaria apparently eats more yogurt per capita than any other country in the world. And um, so kiselom lako, sour milk. Here it is with the traditional uh, dish there and a tribute to Staman Grigorov. If you know, if you go to Google, you know, you'll see Google's always honoring a person or an occasion. And here they honored his birthday because he was the individual who looked through the microscope and he was able to identify the bacteria that um, 
that uh, make the milk uh, go uh, sour. And then he presented his findings at the prestigious Pasteur Institute. And um, so this is um, Dr. Grigorov and Tom. So happy birthday to him back then. Um, and then, yeah, just another, another Supra stew. And you can buy the ultimate Bulgarian food guide too and, uh, and go through the whole thing. And then the rose, uh, Daniela has a nice display over here. Um, this wouldn't be the, um, the attar, the rose oil that is 40,000 euros a liter, but it's still a lovely souvenir. The little dolls come apart and there's a little vial of rose oil that you can take home or give to someone. Um, anything to do basically with roses. Here you've got uh, a rose uh, soap and uh, um, uh, always with that motif. And then you've got textiles. Those are the ethnic costumes. These would be um, carpets there. Again, smaller carpets if you just want something that is not too large. Um, pottery, ceram ceramics. And then going back to the Thracians and the tribute to their working with metals and they're very decorative. These would be uh, belt buck buckles and, and some, other, um, some other objects there. And then I think I have five or six Bulgarians. You may not know the names, but we have John Atanasov, son of a Bulgarian immigrant who changed the world, the inventor of the modern computer. We have um, Valia Balkanska, she was a folk singer and her song accompanied Voyager 1 and 2 into space in 1977. Um, we have Christo who, so after Germany, after Germany became one, the Reichstag, which is the current seat of the German government wasn't in use yet. And Christo who emigrated from Bulgaria, uh, and he was known for, I don't know if you ever remember Christo's display in Central Park. I think he had umbrellas or something. Anyway, who's allowed to wrap the rice tag? So this is for 10 days in 1995. Christo, the name very famous, although he never did return, I think I heard to, um, to Bulgaria. Um, Nina Dobrev, an actress, I, her family emigrated to, um, to Toronto. She's of Bulgarian heritage. And a mural artist by the name of um, Ernesti Nassimo. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. And then um, this gentleman whom you may have seen in the, uh, in the Green Book when it was um, winning the Oscar. I think he was the cellist. He was one of the, one of the musicians in the movies. So um, yeah, so Bulgaria and Balkan wanderings here. And uh, um, my title and my, um, my website and just... A big thanks to everybody on screen and in person for coming and feel free to ask questions. Tell me if I there was something that uh, about Bulgaria that you maybe you you know differently, but um thank you. Thank you and thank you to Holly and the Plymouth Library too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, I can do that. Sure. I know everybody looks pretty happy. I hope so. I hope so. I always time myself because I'm always curious how long they last. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty country. It's a small country, but it's easy to um, travel through and there's a lot to see and uh, um, you can put it on your list. Yeah. I was, yeah, yes. Uh, I was asked what city would you recommend flying into? Probably the capital, Sofia. Yeah. I once flew into Sofia from Toronto. There was a nonstop flight uh, in the 90s that doesn't exist anymore. And Sofia was so fogged in because of the mountains that we ended up in Burgas on the Black Sea coast. But I would say Sofia is your airport and your destination of choice. And really where you wanna start in the capital city because you'll get a, get a feel for, for the country before you branch out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're all ready to go, right? <laughs> Daniela. Yeah, 
Oh. So this is Daniela Nacheva. You don't see her on screen, but she um, writes and publishes the monthly Bulgarian newsletter for Greater Detroit, Metropolitan Detroit. And I actually met her uh, through giving these talks. And so she's a good friend now and she has some um, nice goodies waiting for us over on the side table there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Bulgarian population in Metro Detroit? No, So someone in the audience asked how large the Bulgarian population would be in Metro Detroit. So um, we have some deliberations going on. Maybe 1,000 or rough guess. Mm -hmm. Or 2,000. Okay, another guess. Uh, we're talking about the Macedonian language and the fact that it's a dialect of Bulgarian. So. I don't know if they, in their household, if they spoke a mix of Bulgarian and Macedonian. And we're talking about a guest in the room here who um, has some friends uh, from Macedonia and who spoke a mix of Bulgarian and Macedonia at home. So she was asking that question. So. Oh. Oh. I just want to write to ask one more thing. Today is October 19th, and we tell the Bulgarian church is celebrating uh, St. Bamarilski. The one that oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Your name is John. We have a name day. So ah. Birthday, and also oh, Daniela just told us that today, October 19th, is the name day of St. Ivan Rilski, which translates to John in English, because the name days are celebrated in Bulgaria. So if your name were John, you would be having a special day in Bulgaria today. I didn't know specifically today, October 19th. How about that? Oh, thank you. I learned something new. Okay. Yeah. Well, then we will. I'm sorry online you won't be able to enjoy um, the food with us, but I hope you still learned a lot and enjoyed the talk. So, yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. And thanks, Charlie. You can go ahead and stop the recording. And thanks, everybody, for coming on Zoom.